Good morning. The Subcommittee on Regulatory Reform, Commercial and Antitrust Law will come to order. We are going to vote in anywhere from 20 to 30 minutes. I may uh, be speaking a little faster than I normally do because I would like to get our opening statements in and our distinguished witnesses' opening statements in. So let's begin. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare recess of the committee at any time. We welcome everyone to today's hearing on antitrust concerns and the FDA approval process. And I now recognize myself for an opening statement. This subcommittee has a robust history of examining competition in the healthcare marketplace to ensure patients receive the highest quality treatment at the lowest cost. In the past few years, the subcommittee has held four hearings in this area covering the topics of market consolidation, the impact of the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act on competition, opioid addiction, and trends in pharmacy benefit management. We continue that tradition today, focusing on the pharmaceutical industry and antitrust concerns surrounding the FDA drug approval process. Competition in the pharmaceutical market involves a delicate balance. On one hand, we want to encourage pharmaceutical manufacturers to invest in needed but often expensive research and development in order to bring innovative and life-saving drugs to the market. On the other hand, we also want to encourage sufficient competition to ensure that there is an appropriate check on consumer prices. Innovation is one of the hallmarks of our pharmaceutical industry and should be celebrated. However, there have been allegations that some companies may be abusing their roles as innovators to engage in the manipulation of regulations to preclude generic manufacturers from bringing competing products to the market. Such conduct is anti-competitive anti and should be put to a stop. Since its enactment, the Hatch Waxman Act has provided opportunities for manufacturers to make lower cost generic versions of previously approved drugs available to the people of the United States in a timely manner, thereby lowering overall prescription drug costs for patients and taxpayers by billions of dollars each year. An essential piece of this framework is the ability of generic drug manufacturers to obtain sufficient samples of branded drugs to conduct the testing necessary to support an application for FDA approval of the drug's generic version. Concerns have been raised that generic manufacturers have been prevented from obtaining such samples. In some instances, based on the position that the drugs in question are subject to a risk evaluation and mitigation strategy with elements to assure safe use under Section 505-1, the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. This is more commonly referred to as the REMS program. While enforcing and the enforcement of existing antitrust laws could address the refusal by some branded manufacturers to provide samples to a generic drug manufacturer, a more tailored legal pathway would help to ensure timely resolution of disputes over sample testing, provide clear guidelines, and facilitate healthy competition in the marketplace, benefiting all consumers. For these reasons, Ranking Member Cicilline and I introduced the Creating and Restoring Equal Access to Equivalent Samples, more commonly known as the CREATES Act. This legislation will deter pharmaceutical companies from manipulating sample Availability to block cheaper generic alternatives from entering the marketplace. The CREATE Act will lead to lower costs for patients by ensuring that they have access to safe and effective FDA-approved generic medicines. It will also ensure consumer safety by maintaining safe guard features of the REMS program while closing regulatory loopholes that are used to keep prices artificially high. The Congressional Budget Office has estimated that the bill would result in a 3.3 billion, that's with a B, billion dollar net decrease in the federal deficit. Savings to consumers and private insurers likely would be far greater. I look forward to the hearing uh, of our witnesses. 
views on the CREATES Act as well as on other areas of the FDA approval process which may be subject to anti-competitive measures. And just to get a piece of uh, work out of the way, if there are no objections, I would like to enter a uh, record that I have uh, several letters in support of the CREATES Act and our efforts uh, with this hearing. So without objection, I would like to enter this and I'll read off let, uh, who sent us letters. FreedomWorks, American Health Insurance Plan, International Center for Law and Economics, Coalition to Reduce Spending, Academy of Managed Care Pharmacy, Association for Accessible Medicines, American Society of Health Systems Pharmacists, Pharmaceutical Care Management Association, Consumer Union, Premier Healthcare Alliance, Campaign for Sustainable RX Pricing, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, CVS Health, and Express Scripts. The chair now recognizes the ranking member of the Subcommittee on Regulatory Reform, Commercial Law, and Antitrust, Mr. Cellini of Rhode Island, for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your leadership and for holding today's hearing. Uh, every year, hardworking Americans pay too much for prescription drugs. The cost of prescription drugs has increased by 200% over the past decade. These soaring prices are life-threatening. Kaiser Health reports that a quarter of Americans cannot afford their prescription medicines, while many are skipping or reducing their dosages. This heartbreaking epidemic is particularly harmful for the hundreds of thousands of cancer patients who are forced to skip or delay their treatments because of the immense financial burden of prescription cancer drugs, which can cost more than $159,000 a year. Leading oncologists report that these skyrocketing costs are causing deaths and harming patients on a daily basis. And beyond the human toll of this epidemic, spiking drug prices have a direct impact on federal spending because most cancer patients are older than 65 and are enrolled in Medicare. And there is no upper limit on out-of-pocket costs for these patients, so they can pay as much as $57,000 in lifetime expenses or about 11% of their income, even if they're insured. We must find lasting policy solutions to save lives by lowering the cost of prescription drugs. Earlier this week, Democrats announced a better deal for Americans to stop outrageous prescription drug price increases. The American people deserve a government that's in their corner fighting for them to take on drug profiteering and price hikes. And that's why I'm extremely, extremely proud of my work with Chairman Marino and our introduction of H.R. 2122, the CREATES Act, a targeted solution to reduce drug prices by increasing generic competition. The Federal Trade Commission reports that generic drugs can reduce the price of branded drugs by more than 85%, while the presence of just one generic competitor can decrease prescription drug prices by 20 to 30%. But over the past decade, some branded drug companies have abused safety protocols at the Food and Drug Administration in order to keep affordable drugs out of the market at the expense of hardworking Americans. Congress never intended these safety programs called risk evaluation mitigation strategies to allow a branded drug company to block or delay generic competitors from receiving FDA approval and enter the market. And yet some drug companies have exploited these safety programs to delay generic competition, if only by days and months, to prolong high drug prices. That's because months of delay could be worth hundreds of millions of dollars in additional monopoly revenues as the generic sits on the sideline, as Professor Robin Feldman has noted. And while this abusive behavior often violates the antitrust laws, as the Federal Trade Commission will testify today, these cases are often too timing to provide effective relief. The CREATES Act addresses these delay tactics by creating a tailored path for generic drug manufacturers to obtain the samples that are necessary to bring low-cost drugs to market. The Congressional Budget Office estimates, as the chairman has said, that the bill would result in a $3.3 billion net decrease in the federal deficit, while the estimate of the total cost of this delay for consumers is $5.4 billion. This bill is supported by numerous physicians, hospitals, health insurers, and patient groups along with public interest organizations such as Consumer Union and Public Citizen. CVS Health, which is located in my district, strongly support this bill because it, and I quote, it is vitally important to end practices that delay competition and ultimately lead to higher drug prices, end quote. I again thank the chairman for calling today's hearing along with our esteemed witnesses for their appearances here today, and I look forward to working with my colleagues to ensure an end to profiteering and price gouging by prescription drug companies. And with that, I yield back.
Thank you, David. The chair now recognizes ranking member of the full Judiciary Committee, Congressman Conyers of Michigan, for his opening statement. Thank you, uh, Chairman Marino. Uh, what we're doing today is uh, examining the process for the uh, Food and Drug Administration's method of approval for branded and generic drugs and its effect on competition and drug prices. And it, it sure is timely. Uh, just this past month, uh, my colleagues uh, in the House, uh, Leader Pelosi and Senator Schumer, Mr. Cicilline and others have released a, an excellent white paper called A Better Deal, colon, Lowering Prescription Drug Costs. And it calls for rewriting rules to stop prescription drug price increases lowering drug prices for Medicare and requiring drug manufacturers to publicly release data justifying any significant price increases. I, I support the idea of making prescription drugs affordable and accessible for all Americans and for everybody. Additionally, the ability of lower-priced generic drugs to compete against branded drugs is a, a pretty important consideration that I, I hope we'll get into this afternoon. With this overarching goal in mind, I, I'd like our distinguished witnesses present uh, to consider uh, the following. Uh, to, to what extent uh, to which the Food and Drug Administration's use of risk evaluation and mitigation strategies make it harder for lower-priced generic drugs to enter the market in competition with the uh, of course, the branded drugs. These regulatory requirements are an important safeguard to ensure that drugs are potentially, uh, drugs with potentially dangerous characteristics and side effects are safely and carefully distributed. The process however, may also serve to stifle competition and keep drug prices high, artificially high at that. For instance, these requirements may make it difficult for generic drug manufacturers to obtain samples in order to conduct the bioequivalence testing necessary to gain regulatory approval of a lower price generic equivalent uh, to a branded drug. Indeed, some have alleged that branded drug companies deliberately cite these restrictions as a way of refusing to provide such samples to potential generic competitors. In, in addition, we should, of course, remain vigilant about pay-for-delay schemes, whereby branded drug manufacturers pay generic manufacturers to delay the entry of, the, of a version of branded drugs as the patent, to, as the patent on the branded drug expires. These arrangements are cause for some concern, and in some areas, a lot of concern, because the Supreme Court has already held 
in Federal Trade Commission versus Actavis, they may violate the antitrust laws. And they may contravene longstanding federal policy encouraging the rapid entry of generic drugs into the marketplace in order to dramatically reduce drug prices. So, to what extent should we be concerned about potential abuse of the citizen petition process at the Food and Drug Administration? That agency allows any concerned citizen to solicit changes to agency regulations and other administrative actions. While in principle, this is admirably democratic procedure. Branded drug manufacturers may manipulate it to stifle entry of generic drug competition. For example, by challenging generic drug approvals using this process. Because the agency must review every citizen petition it receives, Generic drug manufacturers allege that branded manufacturers use the petition process to stop or delay agency approval of competing generic drugs with multiple and unwarranted petitions. And despite amendments made in 2007 to address such potential abuse, the agency reports that it remains concerned that many non-meritorious citizen petitions are being filed primarily to delay the entry of generic drugs into the marketplace. Wouldn't it be nice if we could solve this this afternoon at this hearing? I thank uh, Chairman Marino and my ranking member, Cecilini, for their work on this important matter, and a, a, a word of welcome to our witnesses being here today. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, John DeTerra. Now recognize this, <clears throat> the Chairman of the Full Judiciary Committee, Congressman Goodlatte of Virginia, for his opening statement. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and welcome to our witnesses. The, the United States has been and continues to be a champion of free and open markets. An open marketplace cultivates competition among sellers and is the very foundation of maintaining lower prices, higher quality, uh, both in products and services, and superior innovation. The antitrust laws established in this country serve a valuable role in promoting competition and the Judiciary Committee routinely exercises its oversight authority to ensure that these laws are applied in a manner that is transparent, fair, predictable, and reasonably stable over time. One area of essential antitrust oversight is the healthcare industry. Healthcare and its related markets have long been subject to extensive antitrust scrutiny and have been a focal point of the committee for the past several years. This hearing marks the fifth in our series focused on competition in the healthcare marketplace and continues the committee's history of vigilant oversight into this important industry that touches nearly every American. Today, the committee turns its attention to antitrust concerns surrounding the Food and Drug Administration drug approval process and its impacts on competition between branded and generic drug manufacturers. As with approval processes for any industry subject to government regulations, the drug approval process can provide a fertile environment to secure and abuse market power. Although Congress has passed laws aimed at facilitating competition from lower priced generic drug manufacturers, while maintaining incentives for branded drug manufacturers to invest in developing new and innovative drugs, the Hatch-Waxman Act and the surrounding regulatory environment create unique issues that are only present in the pharmaceutical marketplace. For example, a generic drug manufacturer must rely on its competitor's product in order to test bioequivalents so that FDA approval may be sought. 
One of the most common antitrust concerns in pharmaceutical conduct cases occurs when companies engage in activity aimed at delaying the entry of generic drugs, thus leading to higher prices for consumers. Of particular concern today is the potential abuse of certain Food and Drug Administration approval processes intended to ensure safety. Although the FDA has no authority to regulate the cost of a drug, certain FDA policies and practices have substantial ramifications throughout the drug pricing market. Today, the United States has the largest pharmaceutical market in the world, accounting for roughly 40% of the global market. U.S. firms conduct the majority of the world's pharmaceutical research and development and currently hold the intellectual property rights pertaining to most new medicines. While it is imperative that the U.S. continue to remain the world leader and innovator in the pharmaceutical market, it is important that these antitrust concerns be given significant deliberation. The benefits from such leadership and innovation are undermined if our consumers unfairly bear the brunt of anti-competitive conduct through above market prices. I look forward to hearing the witnesses' views on these issues and whether our existing antitrust laws are equipped to address these antitrust concerns in the FDA approval process. I'd like to again thank Chairman Marino for holding today's hearing, and today's testimony will help the committee gain a better understanding of the seriousness of these issues and how they might be addressed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Bob. Without objection, other members' opening statements will be made part of the record. I will begin by swearing in our witnesses, before introducing them, uh, would you please stand and raise your right arm? You swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give before this committee is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. So please be seated. Let the record reflect that the witnesses have responded in the affirmative. Dr. Scott Gobley was sworn in as the 23rd Commissioner of Food and Drug on May 11th, 2017, and if I am pronouncing your name incorrectly, please correct me. You got it. Thank you. Mr. Gottlieb is a physician, medical policy expert, and public health advocate who previously served as the FDA's Deputy Commissioner for Medical and Scientific Affairs, and before that, as a senior advisor to the FDA Commissioner. Mr. Gottlieb has also served as a senior policy advisor at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Mr. Gottlieb was previously a resident fellow at the American Enterprise Institute and a clinical assistant professor at the New York University School of Medicine in Manhattan, where he also practiced medicine as a physician. Having authored over 300 articles, appearing in leading medical journals and other well-respected periodicals, his scholarly career has included working as a staff writer for the British Medical Journal, serving as a senior editor to The Pulse, Journal of the American Medical Association, and serving on multiple editorial boards, including Food and Drug Law Institute's Policy Forum, Value-Based Cancer Care, and Cancer Commons. He is also a member of Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, the Public Policy Committee of the Society for Hospitalist Medicine, and a member of the board for Keystone Center. Mr. Gottlieb received his BA in economics from the Wesleyan University and his MD from Mount Sinai School of Medicine in New York University, where he completed his residency in internal medicine. Welcome, doctor. Mr. Meyer is the assistant director in charge of the Federal Trade Commission's health care division in Washington, D.C. He leads an office of 35 lawyers. That's going to be a tough job and other professionals who investigate and litigate alleged violations of antitrust law by pharmaceutical companies, physicians, and other health care providers. Since November 2015, Mr. Meyer has also been serving as the acting deputy director and more recently as the acting director of the FTC's Bureau of Competition, where he oversees more than 280 lawyers and other professionals investigating and litigating merger and non-merger cases. Mr. Meyer joined the FTC in 1990 and became head of the health care division in 2006. In addition to his work at the FTC, Mr. Meyer has worked in private practice where he focused on antitrust litigation and represented clients before the FTC and the Department of Justice. He has served as a special assistant United States attorney. 
We have a little fraternity going here now. <laughs> Prosecuting criminal cases in the Eastern District of Virginia. He was also a resident advisor to the Indonesian Competition Commission on Jakarta in 2001. Before joining the FTC, Mr. Meyer served as an officer in the United States Army. Thank you for your service. He is a graduate of the George Mason School of Law, has a master's degree in public administration from Old Dominion University and a bachelor's degree from the University of Virginia. Welcome, sir. Each of the witnesses' written statements will be entered into the record in its entirety. I will ask that each of you summarize your testimony in five minutes or less. And to help you with that, you have some lights in front of you. Uh, the light will switch from green to yellow when you have a minute left, and then when it switches to uh, the red, uh, time's out. Uh, I've been in your position. I don't pay attention to the lights. So what I'm going to do is very politely and diplomatically pick up the gavel, and hopefully that will give you an incentive to wrap up. Dr. Gottlieb, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Ranking Member. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before the committee. My name is Scott Gottlieb. I'm a physician and commissioner of the Food and Drug Administration. At FDA, we've undertaken a broad initiative to promote prescription drug competition with the aim of lowering drug costs to consumers. FDA doesn't oversee any aspect of drug pricing as part of our regulatory mandate, but our policies can have a significant impact on the cost of medicines, and ensuring American patients have access to affordable medicines is a top priority for FDA and for the administration. In particular, our policies related to generic drugs can promote competition which lowers drug costs. Similarly, our regulatory policies related to the clinical development of new drugs ultimately impact the cost of these endeavors. Our requirements and their impact on the risks and costs of new drug development can affect the way that entrepreneurs price their finished products in order to justify their investments. In each case, we're closely examining the impacts of our policies. We want to strike the right balance between access and innovation while we hold steadfast to our core consumer protection mandate to make sure the drugs we approve are safe and effective. Today I'd like to briefly review with you policies we're considering and steps we're taking to promote generic drug competition. First, we're improving the efficiency of the generic drug review and approval process to help new generic drugs reach consumers more quickly, but without sacrificing the assurance of safety and effectiveness. Historically, the average generic drug application undergoes four cycles of review by FDA. Through new policies we're implementing, we believe we can sharply reduce this number and reduce total development times. Our average total time to approval for legacy applications has averaged 42 months. We're significantly bringing down that time. Beginning this October, if we get a high quality submission, we'll be able to review and approve it in eight to 10 months, depending on the type of application and I'll report on our progress the following fall. A second major part of our efforts is to improve our policies and scientific approach to the approval of generic competitors to complex or difficult to duplicate brand name drugs. Collectively, this represents a sizable category of medicines that in many cases could be subject to generic competition, but are not. We're looking at how to change that, such as developing clear principles for approving generic versions of these products and issuing those principles well in advance of the time of the per first patent expiry. The third part of our plan relates most directly to the topics we're here to discuss today. I want to make sure that companies aren't gaming our own rules to extend their monopolies on brand drugs and maintain their monopoly pricing by forestalling competition that Congress intended for when it crafted the Hatch-Waxman amendments. One example of this relates to risk management programs we put in place in order to assure the safe use of drugs but where brand manufacturers then deny generic drug developers access, even at fair market value and despite assurances from FDA, to the doses they need in order to run the bioequivalent studies required for applications. This is clearly not what Congress intended. While at least some of these restrictions on access may fall outside our direct purview, we're exploring potential measures we could take, including actions we might take in concert with our colleagues at CMS and, at, and the FTC to prevent this sort of activity. We're also looking at steps we can take to reduce the potential for brand companies to block generic entry by extending the negotiations they're obligated to have over the application of a single shared REMS program. These are cases where they have a REMS program in place to help manage the safe use of a product and the generic entrant is seeking to share the REMS program with the brand sponsor. Here's the bottom line in my view. 
We have a market-based system for pricing medicines that functions, in part, as a way to make sure entrepreneurs have appropriate rewards for their risk-taking. This system has unlocked unprecedented drug innovation that's saving lives and quite literally curing disease. But we need to balance access with innovation. We need to make sure that when the patent and exclusivity periods have lapsed, the point at which Congress intended for vigorous competition to be possible, consumers are able to benefit from the savings that come from generic drug entry and the choice it enables. That's our goal, to do all that we can to make sure markets are efficient and close loopholes that are letting a handful of market participants game the rules in ways that hurt consumers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Doctor. Attorney Meyer. Chairman Marino, Ranking Member Cicilline, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to address the hearing today. It's a very important subject. And I'm pleased to testify about one of the FTC's top priorities, stopping any competitive conduct in the pharmaceutical industry. Such conduct harms American consumers through higher drug prices. I'm also pleased to be here sitting next to FDA Commissioner Dr. Gottlieb. The FTC and the FDA have had a long history of working closely together on these issues and many others as well. And the FTC looks forward to continuing to build on our relationship with the FDA in the months and years to come. Unlike the FDA, however, the FTC is not a sector regulator. Instead, we are primarily a law enforcement agency, and the laws we're charged with um, enforcing are intended to promote competition for the benefit of consumers, and they apply across wide ranges of industries in the United States, not just the pharmaceutical industry. And the way we do our job is we do it by challenging three broad categories of business practices known to harm competition. First, we challenge agreements among competitors that unreasonably restrain trade. Second, we challenge acts of monopolization. And third, we challenge mergers that may substantially lessen competition. The FTC has a long history applying these laws in the pharmaceutical industry. With respect to the three topics of today's hearing, the FTC has brought cases and filed amicus briefs addressing antitrust problems with abuse of the FDA processes in each of the three areas. First are the abuses that occur when brands use FDA-mandated REMS or when they use voluntary distribution systems, either to prevent a generic company from gaining access to the samples it needs to go through the FDA approval process, or secondly, by refusing to negotiate a single shared REMS distribution system. To date, the FTC's actions in this area has been to file amicus briefs in private litigation, because private parties can also bring antitrust cases, not just the FTC, and to explain to courts how the REMS abuse can, in fact, violate the antitrust laws. Second are the abuses arising from so-called pay-for-delay agreements. Pay-for-delay agreements occur in the context in which a brand and a generic company are in patent litigation. The generic is trying to gain entry into the marketplace. It says to the brand company, your patent's not valid, or I do not infringe your patent. They're fighting out a patent case, and at some point they settle the litigation in which the brand one, offers money to the generic, and two, the generic agrees to stay out for some period of time. And we've had a lot of cases in this area and currently have cases in a case called Activist, AbbVie, Allergan, Watson, and Impacts. Third are abuses that can occur with the citizen's petition process. Brands may use the FTA's citizen's petition process to delay generic approval by raising scientific or legal issues that the FDA must respond to before approving a generic. Studies have shown that while these petitions often lack merit, they delay entry of lower cost generics. FTC actions to date include a recent lawsuit that we filed in the case of Virofarm in the District of Delaware. Despite our many efforts, however, there are limits on antitrust law enforcement. First, and, and possibly most importantly, it's not a violation of federal law simply to charge high prices. Secondly, Litigation, which is what I do and what we do at the FTC, can be slow, it's expensive, and it's uncertain. I personally have been working to stop pay for delay agreements for more than 17 years. I have a handful of my colleagues who've been there from the very beginning, and we're still years away from uh, court resolutions of some of those cases. These limitations are the reason why the Commission supports the goals of the CREATES Act, and if enacted, the FTC believes that the CREATES Act would reduce the incentive for brands to use REMS to impede competition from lower cost generics. In closing, I look forward to addressing your questions. And again, thank you for inviting me here today. Thank you, Attorney Meyer. We will now 
begin the Congress members five minutes of questioning, and I will recognize myself for five minutes of questioning. Um, Dr. Gottlieb, I, I want to commend you, first of all, uh, for shining the light on the issues that we're addressing here today. It's, it's critically important. These competition problems have been around for a long time, so I want to better understand FDA's current authorities in this area. One of the principal objects of the CREATES Act is to allow a generic company to seek an injunction from the court to require the sale of a brand's product. To be clear, a court can only order a sale once the generic has received FDA authorization to handle the product. When Congress established REMS authority in 2007, Congress included a provision that said a REMS should not be used to delay competition. It is my understanding that the FDA has authority to level civil monetary penalties when they determine a brand company is delaying competition using the REMS program. Is that correct? There is a provision in the law, Congressman. I also understand the FDA has never used that authority. Are you aware of that? I know it's a complex authority to exercise, Congressman. If they did use that authority, it would require the development of a lengthy record, uh, be time consuming, and use resources. Would you agree with me? I know it's, it's a highly complex to develop the administrative record to exercise the authority, so it would take time, would take a lot of time. And a determination by the FDA that the brand's actions were taken to block or delay the generic application, uh, would you agree with me concerning that? Sorry, I missed the question. That uh, the brand's actions, were, if were taken, would, would delay the generic application. There are a lot of brand actions that delay generic entry, yes. And once all these steps have happened, uh, you have to work with the DOJ to level penalties, correct? If we were to exercise that authority, yes. And penalties, I believe, are relatively modest. Yeah. And this seems, uh, as, a, uh, as a prosecutor, uh, as a former U.S. attorney, these are pretty intense and time-consuming processes. And the FDA only has the authority for drugs that are behind a REMS, and not for voluntary manufacturer's schemes. Is that, that's correct also? Uh, it's a good point that a lot of the restrictions on the ability of the generic companies to get access to the doses are commercially driven as well, co through contracting. It would seem to me that we could resolve these issues uh, and these disputes quicker if competitors had limited resources in the courts to require the sale of some samples when the FDA has found it can safely handle those samples. Um, so that's not a question, but could you please share with us uh, some of your insight on how we streamline this? Well, Congressman, I, you know, you've raised a lot of concerns that are our concerns. Uh, the fact that um, generic companies literally can't get access to the doses they need, the units they need to run the bioequivalent studies to go through the regulatory approval process. That's clearly not what Congress prescribed under Hatch-Waxman. Some of these fall within the scope of um, gaming regulations that exist within FDA's purview, and the REMS is an example. Um, some of them fall within the scope of things branded companies do in the context of commercial contracts to deny the ability of generic companies to get the drugs from either uh, specialty pharmacy companies or uh, other intermediaries like wholesalers. But, you know, it requires between 1,500 and 5,000 physical doses in order to run the bioequivalent studies, and quite literally there are uh, situations, and we see them, where the generics can't get access to those do doses in a timely fashion. Okay. Uh, Attorney Meyer, while the FTC has expressed concerns about anti-competitive abuse of the REMS process, and I think you filed two amicus briefs in, in disputes between manufacturers. It doesn't appear to have brought any enforcement suits. Uh, can you explain why enforcement suits haven't been brought and what would we do to better improve the system? This is an area where we've spent a lot of time looking into it. We've uh, chased down a lot of leads and, and, and taken, um, heard a lot of different complaints. In fact, the FDA have sent us a list of approximately 150 inquiries it's received, and we've reviewed those very carefully to look for a good test case to bring. 
But in addition to the activities of the FTC, there are private litigations. Private companies can bring antitrust cases too, and they have. And as I said before, we filed amicus briefs in a number of those cases to try to assist the court in understanding how the antitrust laws can apply to those behaviors. Thank you. My time has expired, and I do now recognize the, the ranking member of the committee, uh, Congressman Cicilline, for his questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you again to our witnesses. Uh, Mr. Meyer, you uh, explained in your written testimony that delaying generic competition through REMS abuse results in about $5.4 billion in annual cost to consumers. Could you please explain how delaying competition through REMS abuses increases cost to consumers? You know, sort of explain a little bit, uh, when does the FDA require the REMS safety protocol for a drug and how does it result in that kind of an impact on consumers? So, uh, first of all, with respect to the testimony and the $5.4 billion um, uh, figure in the testimony, I, I do want to point out that that was a study done by the generic pharmaceutical industry, as we indicated in the report. So, right. we haven't independently verified that number, um, but it does suggest that this is a problem. With respect to your question about um, what exactly the FDA has to do when it does a review process, that's really a question, I think, that might be better addressed to the, to the FDA. Um, but having said that, there are in, in a number of instances where we have done investigations, I've come to learn some about the standards that the FDA uses, and obviously what they want to do and, and what they um, have to do is make sure that the drug supply is safe and effective, and I think they do a very good job of doing that. And there are certain drugs that, when certain patient populations are exposed to it, can, can be dangerous for those patients and can be dangerous for other people. Um, a, the classic example that often comes up is the thalidomide example, which obviously makes, uh, it, you know, results in, in horrible, horrible potential birth defects if a pregnant woman is exposed to that, and that is in fact subject to a REMS program. So it's those types of drugs that I understand are subject to REMS programs with what are known as a TAZU or elements to assure safe use. But again, I think that might be a question that the FDA can better address than Dr. I can. Uh, Ms. Um, Congressman, these are these are drugs that have uh, certain what we call elements to assure safe use, certain provisions that are put in place at the time of approval to help ensure their safe uh, prescribing by pro providers. So typically, they'll have certain side effects or risks associated with them um, that we feel, um, in order to strike the right risk-benefit balance, we have to have certain measures in place, like provider education or requirements that providers take certain measures um, to subject patients to certain tests to look for. Um, the manifestation of certain side effects. Just as a general matter, and you asked the, the question about the how to save, how would it save consumers money? By and large, the majority of the drugs for which we have risk management plans in place tend to be specialty drugs, and and uh, they tend to be higher priced drugs. And to the extent that um, manipulation of the REMS to forestall the ability of the generic companies to get access to the samples they need to do the bioequivalent studies within delay the generic from filing, filing the application and getting onto the market. Um, that's going to disadvantage consumers because it's just a delay in getting competition where patents might have lapsed that would be lower cost. So, you know, you, you just month by month, every month to your point could add up to a lot of money. Thank you. M Mr. Mar, you, you made reference in your testimony, obviously, to one of the ways that brand drug companies, uh, you know, realize profits is to prevent, uh, refuse to provide samples that are necessary for the development of the generic, which the CREASE Act attempts to address. I think you've already said that you consider that anti-competitive behavior. The, I guess the question I have is, should we consider simply a prohibition against that, an outright prohibition against these pay for delay or refusal to provide? I know they're two different issues, but. Yeah, so, so the, you're right, there are two different issues. Um, but with respect to the samples, I do want to be careful that it's not just merely the refusal to provide a sample that causes an antitrust problem. When we do an antitrust case, the type of case that you'd have to bring in this instance would be a charge of monopolization. That's basically a, a single company acting unilaterally, saying, I'm not going to turn over the samples. One of the elements you'd have to show is this exclusionary conduct, but an additional element in that case you'd have to show is that the company actually has a monopoly and is maintaining or, or, or holding on to that monopoly as a result. So the challenge is not just to say refusing to provide a sample is an antitrust problem, but it's the combination of the refusal to provide it by a monopolist under certain circumstances can violate the law. And what about with respect to pay for delay? What would be, wouldn't it be sensible public policy simply to prohibit those outright that you couldn't contract with another entity to 
prevent the introduction into the marketplace? I mean, that seems pretty obviously on its face anti-competitive. Well, well there, have, there have been a number of different bills that have been floated over the years that would come close to doing what you're describing, um, both on the House side and the Senate side. And there have been various times when the FDC has been asked to look at that and comment on that, and we have. And should somebody put together such a bill again in the future, we'd be happy to provide whatever technical assistance we could on that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Chair recognizes the chairman of the full Judiciary Committee, um, Congressman Goodlatte. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, for your testimony. Um, let me start with uh, Dr. Gottlieb. I've received several inquiries over the years from constituents regarding escalating prices for specific drugs, some of them 100 years old, that have been on the market in every instance for long periods of time, decades. I understand that some of this may be the result of the FDA's unapproved drug initiative. Uh, can you explain what the goal of that program is and whether you think it's been effective? Congressman, there's a, a large um, category of drugs that were effectively grandfathered in when the modern statute um, to require the demonstration of safety and effectiveness was put in place in the 1960s. Um, we refer to them as the DESI drugs, and they never went through a traditional approval process. They never had, um, had to demonstrate safety and efficacy through the traditional uh, clinical trial requirements. Um, we have a program in place to both take these drugs off the market when we feel that there are certain concerns relative to their safety and effectiveness or the way they're being manufactured. We've taken over a thousand unapproved drugs off the market. Uh, and also to try to move certain drugs into the approved space, uh, if, especially for critical medicines where it might have a narrow therapeutic window and you want to make sure it's being manufactured in an appropriate fashion. Um, we've moved these drugs into the market um, through the approval process. Now, it is the case that when that happens, in some instances, and in a lot of instances, when a drug that's previously unapproved becomes an approved drug and we clear the market of the other formulations that might be on the market, they will have some exclusivity. They might have three years of exclusivity under Hatch-Waxman for doing clinical studies. Um, they might have five years of exclusivity in rare cases where they're um, a new, new molecular entity. So they will have a period of exclusivity. I will say that the, the juxtaposition here is that you now have a formal reference listed drug for which you can then bring on generics onto the market when that exclusivity period lapses. And the final point I'd make is... Um, Why did they get a period of exclusivity for a drug that's not new? If they, go, if they do clinical studies to demonstrate safety and effectiveness as part of the FDA approval process, they get a short period of exclusivity. How long Hatch, is a short period? That's three years is, the, is what's prescribed under Hatch-Waxman. Um, I will say I've been, I've been around FDA for about 15 years now, and I've gone through different cycles where at various points in time, we've been criticized for not moving aggressively enough on the unapproved drugs. So it's a real public well, health challenge. Let me ask you about that, because when you take them off the market, is it is it based on safety? Is it based on efficacy? What, what is your standard uh, and what kind of research do you do or does somebody else do that research for you and might it be one of the competitors that does the research for you? What do you rely upon to take the drug off the market in the first place? Well, we're, we're careful in how we take the drug off the market in these instances to make sure that the new entrant can actually supply the market. You say you've done market. a thousand or more. Um, those, those aren't situations where we've necessarily cleared the market of all the drugs in a category. Those are situations where there might have been one drug on the market that had certain problems associated with it. There's only 23 cases where we've had one approved drug come onto the market and then try, made an attempt to clear the market of the competitors. And I think that those are the situations that, that you're referencing. I believe it's 23. Um, you know, it is the case that in order to, if, and this is a balance, and Congress can speak to this, because we, we went through this last time I was at the agency and worked very closely with Congress on this, but you want to provide, if you want these unapproved drugs to come through a regulatory process and develop the data to demonstrate safety and effectiveness and go through the manufacturing requirements, you have to provide an incentive. And the incentive is that if they go through that process and spend the money to do it, they're going to get a, a short period of exclusivity and the FDA is going to make an attempt to clear the market of so potential you, competitors. You, they're going to clear the market of the people who haven't done that, even though they don't want to spend the money and they may have exactly the same result if they were to do it for their drug, because they may be identical drugs. This, I, I understand the concern you're raising, and I would, I would say, well, I've seen say, drugs that have cost 50 times after they get this exclusivity 
what it costs on the way. You're talking about some things that cost two, three dollars for, uh, for a prescription, uh, and suddenly they become several hundred dollars or even a thousand dollars for a, a little tube of, of uh, some kind of uh, skin ointment right. or a, I, a gout drug. I would simply say if we want to go down the path of unwinding FDA's current policy, we need to accept that the unapproved drugs will stay unapproved in perpetuity. And if Congress is comfortable with that, we can, we can contemplate that. But I will tell you, I've been at the FDA when we've been vigorously criticized for not bringing the unapproved drugs. But surely there must the be process. other sources of inf information about the lack of safety of the we, drug. If, if, the, if the issue is, well, the drug doesn't really work, um, you know, obviously, if it's been around for 100 years and people still want to buy it, I'm not sure we should be too concerned about it. Safety, that's a different concern. But if the, if, the, if the mechanism is to let somebody buy into exclusivity as opposed to doing some independent research through universities or something to find out that the drug truly is harmful or based upon uh, medical testimony or medical uh, history with the use of the drug, that's a different situation to we, me. We focus in situations where there are safety questions, and that's where we tend to focus our, our resources. You know, the one that I remember was, I, I believe, pancreatic enzymes, which are used by patients with cystic fibrosis. There was a lot of variability in how those drugs were being formulated that had clinical implications, and the CF community wanted FDA to um, exert more oversight over the safety and efficacy of those products. There are situations where these unapproved drugs on the market do present certain questions of safety and effectiveness, and that's where FDA has tended to focus its attention. But uh, let me ask one more question, if I may. I know I'm over the time, but um, if the, the company that comes in and does these tests for you and gets the exclusivity, if there's no difference between their drug and the drugs that you're taking off the market based upon the formulation of it, um, why, what would be in the best interest do that just to get the work done to prove the safety and the efficacy of the one, because if, to me that uh, if that's the case, there ought to be some limitation, some control. And is this authority based upon the law, or is the authority based upon FDA regulations? This, this, the application of this authority is based on what we've been told to do by Congress in the past. Congress has raised questions With around the statutory the language. Well, the, stat, the way Hatch-Waxman is written, this is how the statute should be exercised. Congress has told us they have concerns around the, the DESI drugs, the unapproved drugs. And I realize when we then take action to move these drugs into the approved column and prices go up in certain anecdotal cases, that well, raises look, concerns look, well. Would, so would, I'm, I'm sympathetic to it. I would expect it. they'd go up something to, so, so the company can recover the cost of doing that. Exactly. But, but 100 times? Well, that's a, that's a separate question, whether it's being priced to value. Yeah, but it all comes together, right? I mean, if you're the consumer, who's been relying upon a drug that your doctors told you you should take and then uh, it suddenly costs 100 times as much money. That's Fully understand your concerns, Congressman. Fully thank, understand them. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. The chair now recognizes the ranking member of the full committee, uh, the full Judiciary Committee, uh, Mr. Conyers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this is a tremendously uh, important subject. Let me... Uh, Ask Director Meyer of the Bureau uh, about Professor Leitzen's testimony, which characterizes requiring access to drug samples as a duty to deal, quote, a, a duty to deal which may undermine incentives for investment and innovation. Uh, what, what do you think of that characterization of providing drug samples as a duty to deal, sir? So the antitrust issue is not whether a brand has a duty to deal. Actually, the antitrust issue is the conditions under which a brand's refusal to deal, its refusal to deal, results in the creation or maintenance of monopoly power. And this is a long-standing concept in the law. It goes all the way back to a, a, a 1919 case involving Colgate, in which the Supreme Court said, yeah, a, parties do not have an obligation to deal with each other, but there may be certain circumstances in which that refusal to deal creates the purpose, has the purpose or the action of creating or maintaining a monopoly, and that's illegal. And that 
case law has continued to develop all the way through the present with a case that is often cited actually by the defense bar in, the, in these issues, the Trinco case, where uh, Justice Scalia said under certain circumstances a refusal to cooperate with rivals can constitute any competitive conduct and violate section two. As this committee knows, when you have a, 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 a take an action where you provide no samples to the generic, it means there's going to be no generic filings with the FDA, there are gonna be no generics and there's gonna be no competition and that could go on literally forever. E even when all the patents have expired, a company could continue to refuse to provide samples, and there could still be a monopoly that simply wasn't what Congress intended. How prevail prevalent a problem is this? Well, there are different, different views, and the difficulty is I don't have any means to get a, to perfect insight into it. On, on the one hand, you have the generic pharmaceutical industry and the study that was done by Matrix Economics Company uh, by a person, an economist named Alex Brill, that says it costs consumers $5.4 billion a year. On the other hand, you have Professor Leitzen suggesting that perhaps it really only involves 20, 22 drugs, something like that. My, my, my suspicion or my intuition is that the probably, it's probably somewhere in between those numbers. But I think some of these drugs are very significant, and these prices can be very, very significant. And even if it's only a few drugs, it could be a very, very significant problem. Moreover, if companies understand that they can get away with this, the expectation is not just what the problem is today, but what might the problem be tomorrow and further into the future as companies recognize that they can adopt this same strategy and apply it to drug products that currently aren't even uh, subject to these restricted distribution systems. Well, what can we up here uh, approach? How do we approach this in a well, as we put sensible way. Uh, so as we put forward in our, our testimony, uh, we believe that the, that the CREATES Act, that the FTC supports the goals of the CREATES Act, and that the CREATES Act goes a lot, very far way to readjust the incentives to, to address this problem. You do, huh? What, 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 is, what, is that, what does that mean? Well, one, one of the problems right now is if, if a brand company refuses to provide the samples, it basically can just sit back and, and, and run out the clock and let it just continue. Um, what the CREATES Act does, as I understand it, is it readjusts those incentives so that it provides greater incentives for the branded company to actually engage in a negotiation and engage in bargaining with the, brand, uh, with the generic to ultimately provide them with samples. And if the bargain doesn't work, it gives the generic companies additional rights to pursue that they could possibly pursue through litigation. So you, when you combine creates with the uh, antitrust laws, you may get an uh, effective strategy. Do you think that's right? I think that's a fair statement. Mm -hmm. Now, I think you've noted uh, that there are several ways that branded firms can use programs strategically to delay generic entry. And at least some of these methods will be difficult to reach effectively under antitrust laws. Is that, is that a fair assessment? That's, that's a fair statement also. Antitrust law doesn't necessarily break down every possible barrier to entry and barrier to competition. We are limited, as I said during the uh, prepared remarks, to bringing cases that fit within one of these three broad categories of antitrust violation. <clears throat> so what are, so what are we do? Well, I think, as, as I've said before, I think the, the uh, <coughs> CREATES Act goes a long way to, to trying to resolve some of these issues. Mm -hmm. Now, last question uh, uh, about vertical agreements. Uh, uh, could this be a violation of the uh, Sherman Act? Yes. It can be under certain circumstances. So, so how do we how do we uh, how do we approach that? As as the Congress or or as as an antitrust enforcer. Well, we're not antitrust enforcers, although we oversight that because it's the law. But 
you know, in, in our congressional capacity here with our chairman and, and the rest of my colleagues, how do, how do we deal with this uh, Sherman Act challenge? So the, the, are you talk, the, if you're talking about the specific challenge of how do you deal with vertical agreements under the antitrust laws, it's my view, and speaking for myself, that we have adequate means under the antitrust laws as currently written uh, to address ourselves to vertical agreements that might be anti-competitive. Okay, this is a good start. I thank you, sir, very much. Thank you. Thank you, John, Mr. If you Chairman. Want, John, if you want to continue when we come back, you're very welcome to do that. They've called votes. We have about 20 minutes, 25 minutes. Uh, we're going to be delayed, but uh, we stand in recess, and we will return as quickly as possible.
The hearing will now come to order again. Uh, sorry for the delay. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Hank Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank the witnesses for their appearance today. I've heard reports that a significant portion of patients either skip, delay, or reduce doses of prescription medication because of high drug prices. What is the uh, FDA doing to address soaring drug prices, and do you believe that the FDA has adequate statutory authority to meaningfully address drug price increases, Dr. Godley? Uh, thanks for the question. Um, I share your concerns when patients forego um, necessary doses because they can't afford their drugs. That's, that's a concern of ours. Um, it falls squarely in our public health mandate to worry about issues of, of access to ne needed medications. Um, I, with respect to your question about do we have adequate authority, I would, I would answer by saying I think we have untapped authority. I think there's things we could do within the scope of our current authorities um, to tr try to provide for more competition in the marketplace consistent with what Congress intended when it passed Hatch-Waxman. Um, so, for example, we're looking at places we can make our generic drug approval process more efficient without sacrificing on the safety and effectiveness that people depend on um, with respect to that, the standard that we, we maintain the market so that people can't come into the market by, for example, buy off low volume generics that might be used infrequently, raise the price substantially, um, knowing that it might take us an average of 42 months, which was the old standard, to get a subsequent generic drug approved in that category. So they're taking advantage of what I've called a regulatory arbitrage, knowing that they could raise prices, and even if competition comes into the market, it's going to take us a long time to approve that. So we've committed to reviewing generic applications in eight to ten months for high quality applications going forward. I think there's, there's a, a number of places like this where we could um, address issues of access, which could give people more low-cost options. Clearly another one is the topic of today's hearing, which is places where the generic companies can't get access to the samples they need, where the branded companies might be gaming certain rules to deny them the access to the, bio, the samples they need to do their bioequivalent studies. Well, with the um, authority that sh can be expanded that would uh, enable drug pricing to be more competitive, do you believe that the FDA needs additional resources to address that challenge, or are the resources that you're getting now and what is projected uh, for you to get uh, according to the Trump budget plan? Uh, well, we can always do more with more congressmen, and the generic drug approval group, Office of Generic Drugs in particular, um, has a very heavy burden and a very heavy workload, and we're not at the point where we're at a steady state um, with respect to generic applications where we, we will always have a certain cohort in-house that are being worked, but we're continuing to build that number, so we're not, we're not getting out generic applications at the same pace that we're getting them in. We will get there shortly, I believe, but it's a very, it's a, it's a challenging, um, dynamic because the market is continuing to expand. We're getting more applications. And so that group works, works very hard. I wouldn't say that we, there's not an opportunity to look at new authorities that could address well, no, some. No, 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 I'm speaking of resources. Resources. No, I was, I, 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 I was addressing resources. You also asked about authorities. But we can always do more with more, Congressman. There's no question that there are. You need more to, uh, to do your job more effectively? Uh, I, I feel confident that we're going to meet our goals with the resources we have if the user fees are passed uh, yeah, in a timely I, fashion uh, yeah, by the deadline. I understand yeah. that you don't really want to delve into that issue <laughs> Fair uh, enough. forthrightly. Uh, but let me turn to Mr. Meyer. And uh, some have suggested that there is no need for legislation to address reverse settlements, also known as pay for delay agreements, in light of the Supreme Court's holding in FTC versus activists that these agreements, quote, have significant adverse effects on competition, end quote. Do you agree? What I would say is we've made a great deal of progress, and, and, and it's not just the FTC. There are private cases. There are cases brought by states' attorneys general. And, and I, I've lost the exact count, but there may be more than 20 cases going on right now across the country. Um, and I do think, based on evidence we've seen, that pharmaceutical companies have pulled back on, on how frequently they're doing these and to what degree and how long the delay is. Um, 
you know, the commission itself hasn't taken a position on any specific legislation. Um, but again, I think if there, if somebody's got a legislative proposal and uh, thinks that they can address the problem uh, more rapidly and better than what we're able to do through law enforcement, um, I'm sure that we would be happy to help in any way that we can to provide any technical assistance that we could. Thank you. Uh, I yield back. Chair recognizes Congressman from Florida, Mr. Gates. I, I thank the chairman, and I'm grateful for the hearing. Currently, the federal government maintains a patent on cannabis. And for those that may find that surprising, it's patent number 6630507. And And I also believe that the federal government, through its various appendages, has engaged in anti-competitive practices as it relates to cannabis. And so I'm grateful for the chairman calling a hearing, having the FDA here. Uh, Dr. Gottlieb, marijuana is a Schedule I drug, right? Yes, that's right, Congressman. And for those watching, a Schedule I drug means that the federal government's taken the position that marijuana has no medical use. Is that right? It has not been demonstrated to be safe and effective for a clinical use. That's right, Congressman. And so as we look at Schedule I in some context with the schedules of other drugs, hydrocodone is a Schedule II, right? Uh, I believe so, Congressman. And raw opium is a Schedule II, right? Um, I believe it has certain, certain clinical applications, that's right. And powdered opium is a Schedule II, right? You probably have a list, I believe that's correct, yes. And fentanyl is a Schedule II, right? That's correct. And methamphetamine is a Schedule II, right? That's correct. And even cocaine is a Schedule II, right? It has certain clinical uses, yes, Congressman. And so when assessing whether or not has, a drug has these acceptable medical uses, there's a five-part test that assesses the merits is one of the elements of that test that there must be adequate safety studies demonstrating appropriate medical use? I believe so. I'm not intimately familiar with the, um, the five-part test. I know what you're, you're referring to. I believe it is. And so in order to meet that test and demonstrate potential medical use, one would presumably need to do research, right? You would need to do clinical studies. And how does one do a clinical study on a Schedule I drug currently? Um, there's currently the ability to uh, study marijuana, and there's a number of INDs. There's probably a few dozen INDs in-house right now studying either the, um, the ingredient itself or an extract from it. And there's, an improved, there's some approved therapies based on the extract from, medicinal, from, from marijuana. If the University of Florida in my state wanted to engage in studies regarding the medical use of cannabis, would that be more or less difficult than if they wanted to study the medical use of cocaine? I don't know, Congressman. I'd, I'd have to get back to you on that and ask the, uh, the experts at, at my drug center. If, well, I'd very much like to hear that. If anyone in the federal government and anyone who works at the FDA is taking the position that it's not more difficult to study medical application of a Schedule II drug like cocaine than a Schedule I drug like marijuana, I'd be very eager to see uh, what the basis for that was. Uh, right now, I've been told by universities in my state that were they to engage in research on the medical application of marijuana, they could potentially impair over $100 million in other federal grants that they receive. Is that something that you're familiar with? Congressman, it probably wouldn't fall within our purview um, if there are issues with getting access to it. It falls outside the scope of our jurisdiction. A lot of that falls within the jurisdiction of DEA. Well, as a physician yourself, as an FDA commissioner, do you have an opinion on whether or not marijuana ought to be listed as a Schedule I drug? I haven't reviewed the literature, Congressman. There is no, there is no clinically demonstrated use for marijuana right now. There is no approved use for smoked marijuana. It has not gone through uh, clinical studies to prove safety and effectiveness for any indication. Does it seem like a logical tautology that we say we cannot declassify marijuana as a Schedule I drug because we don't have the clinical studies and its, its status as a Schedule I drug impairs further clinical studies? Well, look, Congress has the authority to take this up, and I think it's been taken up in some forms in the past and contemplated by Congress. Um, the clinical studies, as I understand it, and I made the point that there's a number of INDs in-house, some of that for, is, I believe, for the raw, the raw ingredient, which I think is the, the, uh, the subject of your question. Some of it is for the extracts from marijuana. So there are clinical studies going on in people who are studying the safety and effectiveness in, in rigorous trials that could potentially lead to an approved indication if they're successful. 
Yeah, and, and I know that right now, I believe it's the University of Mississippi that is the only place where they can grow the product in order to do the studies. Are you familiar with that dynamic? The issues around access and growing, growing and an access to product to do clinical studies for regulatory pur purposes falls outside of our direct jurisdiction, Congressman. Well, I want to take my remaining few moments to thank Chairman Goodlatte for the public commitment that he made at a recent Judiciary Committee meeting that we're going to study this question of research. I also want to thank the ranking member of this subcommittee for uh, his desire to work on research applications for medical cannabis. It seems entirely unacceptable to me that we block research that could potentially show us the medical use that would then justify delisting cannabis, and I yield back. Chair now recognizes the Congressman uh, from California, Congressman Swalwell. Thank you, Chair. And uh, Chair, the, the beauty of our democracy is that I sat here for hours yesterday, and I think I disagreed with 100% of the things that Mr. Goetz uh, said yesterday. But today, I sit here, and I agree 100% with what he just said. So I'm glad that uh, he and I and Mr. Cicilline and Others can work together on what I agree is an important issue. Uh, but I do thank the chair and the ranking member for calling us here to talk about uh, how we can lower drug prices and increase uh, the therapeutic drugs uh, and the therapies and drugs that can get to the market to help people. I, I did have some questions, uh, Dr. Gottlieb and Mr. Meyer. Thank you both for appearing. With respect to REMS, uh, risk evaluation and mitigation strategies, what is the percentage of REMS on the market with respect to total number of drugs on the market? Um, I don't know what, I couldn't tell you what the total is right now. In 2016, there were 115 new drugs or new biologics approved, and nine were approved with REMS. So that gives you a sense of the proportion by year. Um, and it's been fairly steady with respect to the, the number of drugs that are getting approved with REMS, so it's not something that's spiking up. Do you believe that all REMS are cre created equally? And what I mean is, for example, certain controlled stu substances like opioids and fentanyl and sodium oxybate, which is you know, commonly referred to as the date rape drug, uh, they are regulated under REMS, but they seem to be uh, quite unique in that they are to me at least, in the category of those that you especially uh, want to control and protect. Would you agree with that? Yeah, there's, there's some common situations where you see REMS apply drugs that um, have abuse potential, can be diverted, drugs, for example, that have risks of teratogenicity associated with them, where you might want to implement certain testing before the application of the drug. So there are some standard categories. If you look through all the drugs that have REMS, you'll see some patterns, for sure. And, and Commissioner, you wrote on July 6, 2017, in a jamanetwork.com uh, article entitled Marshalling FDA Benefit Risk Expertise to Address the Current Opioid Abuse Epidemic, that the FDA limits prescribing of sodium oxybate to certified prescribers. In addition, the drug may be dispensed only to enrolled patients by a certified pharmacy and only by a certified pharmacy that ships drugs directly to patients. Sodium oxybate is not available in retail pharmacies. And you actually laid out, I think, a good case as to why opioids uh, should also, uh, you know, be controlled and regulated, uh, it, you know, in that same manner in talking about the opioid uh, crisis. Do you foresee, as, as we look at making sure that drugs can get to the market and that, you know, we are not allowing anti-competitive practices to take place, that there is a special category, though, for uh, those uh, types of drugs that have, as I just mentioned, those certain characteristics that you really want to make sure controls are in place? Uh, that, that's absolutely true, Congressman. It's been the case that for certain drugs, uh, historically certain controls have been put in place when there's special circumstances where there's very unique risks associated with them. Um, the, the thrust of that article was related to um, an imperative by the FDA to consider the risks associated with the potential illicit use of the drugs um, in how it looks at risk-benefit balance, both pre- and post-market, uh, as well as the risks associated with the labeled use of the drugs. And we were, we were laying out um, the basis for why we believe we need to look at the illicit risk as well. But it is the case, to your underlying point, um, that there are certain risks associated with drugs where historically we have applied REMS and, historically, and we will likely apply them going forward. And a lot of them are well-defined. 
Right. And it, it sounds like the challenge for us, uh, Mr. Meyer, I'd be interested in, in your thoughts uh, as lawmakers, is to make sure that we don't have anti-competitive practices, but that we're still doing everything we can to protect the public from, you know, God forbid, a, a date rape drug uh, being, you know, widely accessible without any reins or controls. Well, I think that's precisely right, is finding that balance. Thank you. Seeing no other Congress members on the dais are questioning, this concludes uh, our first panel. I want to thank Dr. Gottlieb. I want to thank Attorney Meyer for being here. Uh, you were very helpful, and you are excused. And now we call the uh, second panel to come up and to the tables. Now that you all are comfortably seated, I would ask you to stand and raise your right hand to be sworn in. You swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give before this committee is the whole truth, nothing but the truth to help you, God. Please be seated and let the record reflect that the uh, witnesses have responded in the affirmative. I'm going to read each of your bios, and then we will begin with you then making your five-minute statements, but I'll go through all four bios first. Okay. David Olson is an associate professor at Boston College Law School, teaching patents, intellectual property, and antitrust law. Prior to joining Boston College, he worked at Stanford Law School's Center for Internet and Society, where he researched in patent law and litigated copyright fair use impact cases. Before entering academia, Professor Olson practiced as a patent litigator at the law firm of Kirkland and Ellis LLP and clerked for Judge Jerry Smith of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit. He earned his bachelor's degree from the University of Kansas and his J.D. from Harvard Law School. Welcome, Professor. <laughs> Professor Lutzen? Litzen. Litzen. Thank you. I apologize. Professor Erica Litson is an associate professor at the, of uh, law at the University of Missouri School of Law. Professor Litson researches, writes, and teaches primarily in the areas of drug and device regulations, intellectual property, and administrative law. She recently completed a historical and empirical examination of the new drug research and development paradigm in the United States and the relationship between the length of that process and incentives to innovate. Prior to teaching, she was in private practice, including eight years as a partner at Covington and Berlin in Washington, D.C. Professor Litson was involved in every major amendment to the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act between 1997 and 2014, working as outside counsel and sometimes lobbyists for various individual companies as well as the trade association, Pharma. She serves in the leadership of the Food and Drug Law Institute and served for many years in the leadership of the Science and Technology section of the American Bar Association. The professor received a bachelor's degree in history from the University of North Carolina, where she graduated with honors. 
her master's degree in history from UCLA and a law degree with high honors from Duke Law School. Professor, welcome. Alan Abbott is the Rumpel Senior Legal Fellow and Deputy Director of the Mies Center for Legal and Judicial Studies at the Heritage Foundation. Prior to joining the Heritage Foundation, he served as Director of Patent and Antitrust Strategy for BlackBerry and in a variety of senior government positions, including Director of Antitrust Policy for the Federal Trade Commission, Acting General Counsel of the Commerce Department, Chief Counsel for the National Telecommunications and Information Administration, and Senior Counsel in the Justice Department. Mr. Abbott is an adjunct professor at the Antonin Scalia Law School at George Mason University and was a visiting fellow at All Souls College, Oxford University, and a Wesserstein Fellow at Harvard Law School. He is also a member of the leadership of the American Bar Association's Antitrust Section and a non-governmental advisor to the International Competition Network. Attorney Abbott received his uh, bachelor's degree from the University of Virginia, his master's degree in economics from Georgetown University, and his JD from Harvard Law School. Welcome. Aaron Kesselheim, am I right? Thank you. Is an associate professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School and a faculty member in the division of pharmacoepidemiology and pharmacoeconomics in the Department of Medicine at Brigham and Women's Hospital. His research focuses on the effects of intellectual property law and regular policies on pharmaceutical development, the drug approval process, and the cost, availability, and use of prescription drugs, both domestically and in resource poor settings. Jen Center for Primary Care at Brigham and Women's Hospital. He is a member of the New York State Bar and is a patent attorney. And within the division, Dr. Kesselheim leads the program on regulation, therapeutics and law, and interdisciplinary research core focuses on intersections among prescription drugs and medical devices, patent health outcomes, and regulatory practices and the law, and modernizing clinical trials, and served as a consultant for the NIH, FDA, Institute of Medicine, USPTO, and numerous state government offices. He has been a visiting scholar at the Yale School of Medicine and School of Management, and a visiting associate professor of law at Yale Law School. Dr. Kesselheim earned his bachelor's degree from Harvard College, his JD from the University of Pennsylvania Law School, his MD from the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine, and his MPH from Harvard School of Public Health. Doctor, welcome. Each of the witnesses' written statements will be entered into the record in its entirety. Uh, I ask that each of you summarize your statements uh, in five minutes or less. And to help you, you have lights in front of you when that light uh, switches from the green to yellow, you have a minute left, and from yellow to red means your time's expired, but as I told the last group, when I sit there, I never look at the lights, so I will uh, diplomatically pick up the gavel, and maybe that'll give you an indication to, to wrap it up. Now we're gonna hear from our distinguished panel, and Professor, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chairman Marino, Ranking Member Cicilline, and members of the subcommittee. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to testify today. Uh, a more detailed version of my remarks is available in the written testimony, as you said. Let me state from the outset my firm belief that patents are necessary to give adequate uh, incentive to develop new drugs. After patent expiration, however, market competition from generics is the best way to provide patients with life-saving drugs that they need at the best prices. I believe that the CREATES Act, which is one of the things being considered at this hearing, uh, can be an important step in addressing abuse of FDA regulations. Forcing brand companies to share samples with generics is necessary, will not undermine incentives to invest in inventing new drugs, and does not violate patent or antitrust policy. Moreover, the narrowly ta tailored approach of the CREATES Act is superior to antitrust litigation. I would be pleased to discuss these issues more with the subcommittee. But I want to focus my oral remarks on the problem of abuse of RIMS patents and the FDA approval process. 
In addition to performing bioequivalence studies to support an ANDA, FDAAA, uh, the FDAAA Act, requires that generic and brand manufacturers use a single shared RIM system for risk mitigation unless the brand manufacturer's system is either one, too burdensome, or two, is protected by a patent or a trade secret that the brand company will not license. The problem that has arisen is that some brand companies have patented their RIMS systems or their RIMS with elements to assure safe use, a TASU, and then have refused to license generics. Uh, this means that the generics cannot use that system, but more problematically, in some cases, the brand companies have then gone on to file citizen petitions arguing that a generic may not use a, another or comparable version of a RIMS with a TASU program that the generic comes up with on its own because no other system would be as safe or effective as the patented Itasu. What this effectively does is keep uh, generics off the market for the entirety of the period of the RIMS with Itasu patent, if successful. This has been done, uh, asserted more than once. For example, Celgene took this approach in arguing that generic versions of thalamid could not be sold. Besides this, brand companies also list RIMS patents in the Orange Book, notwithstanding the fact that a RIMS patent is, for a method of use, is not for a method of use, but rather a method of distribution. This, results, uh, this could result in extension of the monopoly over a drug for almost 20 more years, depending on the date of filing of the RIMS patent. It's worth noting that the parameters for a RIMS with the TASU system are set forth in the FDAAA of 2007, and specific requirements for a TASU are given in the Act. Uh, for instance, the FDAA sets out the requirements for Itasu, including very simple and straightforward things like only like educating doctors and hospitals, only allowing doctors and hospitals that have been educated and certified to prescribe the drug, having restricted distribution of the drug, uh, uh, patient testing and information, counseling patients, monitoring patients to make sure the drug is uh, administered safely, and maintaining a database to coordinate all this information. This is set out in the statute. If you look at RIMS with the TASU patents, which I've spent some time doing, what you note is that they track very closely to the statute. For example, claim one from Merck's RIMS patent for Interreg contains the following steps. Identifying relevant hospitals, providing such hospitals with literature about the drug, wherein the drug is inter Interreg or a generic, identifying a subpopulation of hospitals which have measures in place to limit use of the drug, uh, wherein said measures comprise order sets, protocols, or guidelines, then registering the said pop subpopulation using a computer-readable storage medium, authorizing them to dispense the drug, uh, and monitoring the patients. Very closely tracks the statute, and yet this is being patented. Uh, the problem with this is that uh, uh, not only might this be obvious, but if generics may not use the patented system, they may not be able to safely distribute the drugs and may be kept off the market. There's no solution to this problem under the status quo. The CREATES Act does provide a narrowly tailored and appropriate solution. By requiring branded and generic drugs to uh, companies to enter into a shared single uh, RIM system within 120 days of a request, uh, this forces them to share, unless, unless a comparable system uh, can be approved by the secretary. The beauty of this is that what it will do, this approach will do, is it will stop brand companies from abusing RIMS patents if they argue that there is no ability to distribute the drug except through the RIMS process, then what the statute does force them to do is to share their process. And I would just uh, uh, wrap up by saying that that forced sharing is neither a violation of patent policy nor of antitrust law, and I'd be happy to speak more to that uh, uh, in the question and answer. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Professor Litson. Chairman Marino, Ranking Member Cicilline, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for this opportunity to speak with you today. I was asked to talk about three aspects of the FDA framework that are the focus of complaints that brand companies are acting improperly and may be violating antitrust law. The first is FDA's citizen petition process, which furthers the open government principles of transparency, public access, and accountability. Anyone may petition FDA to take any administrative action, and the petition and any comments on it are public documents. Petitions play an important role in our political system. 
The public has a strong interest in ensuring that executive branch agencies work within the constraints of the laws that Congress writes. And our robust petitioning practice adds a layer of surveillance to complement the oversight function of the legislative branch and the review function of the judicial branch. You have been told that brand companies file frivolous petitions that delay generic drug approval. These claims rest on anecdote and rhetoric, not evidence. Congress passed a law in 2007 stating that FDA may not delay approval of a generic drug due to a petition unless necessary to protect the public health. Since then, FDA reports only five generic drugs have been delayed without public health justification out of more than 4,000 copies approved. A high denial rate is not proof that petitions are frivolous. Drug approval decisions can require difficult judgment calls about appropriate regulatory policy in the face of scientific uncertainty and about the flexibility of the law to accommodate new facts. Differences in opinion and perspective are natural. A valid petition may simply lack persuasiveness at the end of the day. Congress has also been told that innovative companies use REM restrictions, REMS restrictions to block generic drug approval. To the best of my knowledge, though, innovators refuse to provide samples primarily because they have concerns that requesting companies lack adequate safeguards to address the risks presented by these drugs. And these concerns are reasonable. Access restrictions are usually imposed to mitigate severe side effects, like birth defects or irreversible organ damage. And even minor lapses in safety protocols by any party at any point can have horrific consequences. If Congress wants to encourage innovators to provide samples, it should protect them from liability arising out of the actions of a third party once a restricted drug has left the innovator's special access system. We should not force innovators to provide their products to generic companies. If a drug is under patent, this would require the company to practice its patent for the benefit of a competitor. It is a bedrock principle of US law that a patent owner has no duty to practice its patent at all. We lack evidence of a systemic problem that would justify such a fundamental change to the intellectual property system. Only 22 brand drugs have ac access restrictions and no generic applications, and more than half of those are so new that FDA statute doesn't allow approval of a generic or biosimilar anyway. It's not clear how many, if any, lack generic competition because an innovator didn't share its drug. Finally, there are concerns when the price jumps on a drug that has been inexpensive for years. Sometimes this results from FDA's unapproved drugs initiative, and it's important to understand why this happens. Several thousand drug products are marketed without the required FDA approval. Many have been used for half a century or longer, and some are even covered by insurance. Some are not safe. Others are not effective, which is a problem because it keeps patients from drugs that do work. FDA focuses its enforcement efforts on the companies that sell these drugs, which present a public health concern. FDA can't force the other companies to file applications. It would have to threaten enforcement action, and enforcement action threats are effective only if backed up. This would require resources that FDA doesn't have. It would also take medicines away from patients. So after approving an application, FDA removes the competing products from the market. This ensures that patients receive the specific product that was studied, and it preserves the integrity of the approval system. It also encourages applications. Usually generics can be approved three years later, but in the meantime, the company that submitted the application can recover its costs. This company hasn't done anything wrong. In fact, it's the one company that chose to comply with the law, to bring an illegally marketed product into the FDA system, but the system has taken away a cheap medicine from patients. Clearly, we need a better solution that maintains the integrity of the drug approval scheme, but doesn't deprive patients of drugs they rely on. In sum, regulated industries, consumers, and other stakeholders share responsibility with FDA for the public health mission enshrined in the statute. When rhetoric and anecdote are laid aside, the evidence suggests that regulated entities generally operate in good faith within this framework, and when companies protect their property rights, participate in open government, or protect themselves from un fair liability exposure, it would be a mistake to take action against them. Instead, we should look for ways to support FDA in its public health mission and to encourage private choices that we prefer as a public policy matter. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Attorney Abbott. 
Uh, Chairman Marino, Ranking Member Cicilline, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, uh, I applaud you for convening this uh, hearing on a very important public policy matter. Uh, the views I express today are my own and should not necessarily be construed as representing any official position of the Heritage Foundation. Today I will briefly note the interplay between regulation and the competitive process before commenting specifically on a potential abuse of FDA citizen petitions. Then I will summarize my views on a CREATES Act of 2017. Extensive economic research demonstrates that regulated entities may manipulate the regulatory process to undermine competition. Such regulatory manipulation is harmful to the American economy. It often deters entry into a market and, and thus precludes competition on the merits, thereby raising prices above competitive levels, reducing product quality, spawning economic in inefficiency, and deterring innovation, which is a key driver of economic growth. As a general matter, in order to maximize economic welfare, federal regulators should seek to devise rules that are as pro-competitive and as little subject to anti-competitive manipulation by private parties as possible, consistent with statutorily set goals. And I'm not commenting specifically on FDA rules, but I think the FDA certainly should and doubtly will go about doing that. There are principles of guidance provided by organizations such as uh, the OECD, International Competition Network, in which I'm involved. Uh, and there's also general uh, guidance available from competition economists, for example, at the Federal Trade Commission and Justice Department, uh, who actually in the past, in the 70s, provided a very important role in promoting regulatory reform in transportation and aviation. Now, one particular sort of regulatory manipulation that undermines competition is the taking of actions by an incumbent firm to forestall entry into the market by a potential competitor. References have been made to uh, potential abuse of FDA citizen petitions to delay entry from producers of generic versions of branded drugs. Uh, current regulations require the FDA review and respond to every citizen petition it receives creating the potential of delay. Now, claims have been made that citizen petitions have been filed to undermine competitive generic entry into certain pharmaceutical matters. Those concerns have been noted by the FDA, for example, in a 2015 report. And most recently, in February 2017, the Federal Trade Commission filed a complaint in federal district court alleging that a Shire Viral Pharma a branded uh, pharmaceutical company engaged in sets, a series of meritless filings, including 24 FDA citizen petitions to delay a generic entry into a particular market. Now, clearly baseless FDA filings made by brand name pharma firms lacking any plausible efficiency just, justification used solely to forestall competition uh, undermined a competitive process. FDA and Congress certainly should consider what, if any, additional legislative or regulatory steps may be appropriate to curb such abusive filings, including, but not necessarily limited to, reform of the citizen petition process. Now, the Federal Trade Commission suit against Shire Biopharm appears to advance sound policy. I'd uh, note, however, a slight uh, bit of caution Although antitrust actions to curb clearly pretextual petitioning had the potential to reduce harmful regulatory delays, such cases need to be selected with great care by public officials. I believe the Federal Trade Commission certainly appears to have done that in this case, but certainly uh, you need, want to be careful, and uh, the Supreme Court and its uh, case law sort of cabin the bringing of suits of that kind. Now, the creates of act CREATES Act of 2017 is a modified and, I believe, improved version of its 2016 CREATES Act, on which I testified favorably before the Senate Judiciary. Now, uh, the 2017 Act uh, uh, gives the FDA more discretion than the 2016 Act to approve alternative safety protocols for high-risk drugs uh, rather than require parties to uh, de develop shared safety protocols, and it does away with a problem of concern of alleged free riding on uh, safety protocols developed by the branded company. 
Uh, now, the 2017 Act also uh, creates a statutory gap. As explained in my testimony, and as I did my testimony last year, there are real limitations in the application of the antitrust laws to cases of regulatory violations and refusals to supply. Not that it's necessarily impossible, but these cases are very hard to bring. Uh, and uh, because of that, I think the CREATES Act is appropriate and narrowly tailored to fill a niche that antitrust may not really be able to address appropriately. Thank you once again. I uh, look forward to your questions. Thank you, Attorney Abbott. Dr. Kesselheim. <clears throat> Chairman Marino, Ranking Member Cicilline, and other members of the subcommittee, thank you for this opportunity to join you today. The reason today's hearing is so important is that low-cost generics and biosimilars improve patient adherence and clinical outcomes. Gener and generics have led to trillion dollars in healthcare system savings over the last decade. However, too often, brand name manufacturers work to delay the availability of generics using different business strategies. I'm going to mention briefly five. First, most drugs have patents covering their active ingredients, but manufacturers will seek secondary patents on peripheral features, such as the drug's metabolite or method of administration. Generic manufacturers then have to design around these patents or challenge their validity in court. One classic example was the anti-ulcer medication Prilosec, which was protected for additional years by a patent on the pill's coating. In one study I led, we found that Medicaid alone could have saved $600 million on this single drug had a low-cost generic been available before this delay. In another study of two HIV drugs, we found nearly 200 such secondary patent claims threatening to delay generic availability for 12 years. Another strategy aided by these secondary patents is product hopping, in which manufacturers switch to different products, sometimes trivially different, pulling their old, generic, um, their old product off the market to stay one step ahead of generic manufacturers. For one antibiotic drug, the manufacturer switched first from a capsule to a tablet, then to a slightly different dose, then to a tablet with a single score, and finally to a tablet with two scores. Problematic patents may be challenged in court, but a third delaying strategy is for brand name manufacturers to make substantial payments to generics to end these cases in so-called pay-for-delay settlements. The FTC estimated in 2010 that such settlements would cost Americans $3.5 billion annually extra over the subsequent decade. An analysis revealed that when these cases were litigated to completion, two-thirds of the cases related to secondary patents, and in those cases, generics were victorious. Pay-for-delay settlements are naturally much more likely to cover challenges over secondary patents. A fourth strategy involves preventing generic manufacturers from getting samples or other key information that they need for FDA approval, and we've talked about that a lot today already. To help the HIV drug Daraprim sustain its 5,000 percent price increase, the manufacturer restricted the distribution through a single specialty pharmacy in part so that generics couldn't get it. The FDA has received about 150 inquiries from generic manufacturers regarding inability to secure samples. For drugs protected by special REMS prescribing restrictions, generic manufacturers need to be able to use the same system for their interchangeable drugs, but brand name manufacturers have delayed generic entry by refusing to share information about their REMS or getting secondary patents covering their REMS processes. Finally, as uh, Mr. Abbott explained, manufacturers use citizens' petition requests to the FDA to delay generic drug entry. Um, one review of five years of petitions found that 87% of these petitions were filed by manufacturers of brand name drugs, and 92% were ultimately denied. Relying on FTC antitrust enforcement is not sufficient to stop these tactics. Patients need Congress to step in. A first step would be to pass the CREATES Act, which provides a process for requiring manufacturers to provide key drug samples and can prevent some REMS abuses. But this committee should also consider other potential reforms. I'm going to mention four, and I have other suggestions in my written comments. First, to prevent improper secondary patents from delaying generic entry, Congress should require formal patent review when these patents are listed with the FDA. Many secondary patents would not pass such scrutiny and could be weeded out before lengthy litigation is required. Second, the committee should consider additional mechanism to address problematic pay-for-delay settlements that continue uh, to this day, even after the FTC versus Actavis case, including preventing settlements with transfers of value um, for delayed entry over the cost of the litigation, or increasing the penalties for settlements found to be anti-competitive, such as full disgorgement of profits or treble damages. Third, all terms of REMS should be public information, and REMS patents should not be able to be listed with the FDA. Ultimately, I believe we should move to a system in which it is the FDA with sufficient resources that controls and manages the REMS as a public good, because it will increase efficiency for patients if brand names and their interchangeable generics are all part of the same REMS. 
To address the misuse of citizens' petitions, the committee could also expand the opportunities for the FDA to summarily reject petitions without requiring an in-depth review. Manufacturers of brand name drugs use many strategies to delay generic entry, uh, of which I've only highlighted a f um, um, uh, some of them today. That is bad for patients, bad for the economy, and it reduces innovation. One study found that it was the ending of market exclusivity periods, in, con in contrast to their indefinite extension, that was most associated with the introduction of new brand name products. The CREATES Act is a laudable first step in helping address some of these strategies, but other policy reforms are also needed. I appreciate the committee's commitment to solving these issues and would be happy to continue to be involved in the deliberative process. Thank you, Doctor. We'll now begin with uh, questioning. There'll be other members that may come in and out. Uh, I'm going to start off with a question that for each of you, if you care to answer it, I'll start with Professor Olson and work our way down to Dr. Kesselheim, and then I have another question that I would like each of you to respond to if you care to, and we'll, then I would start with Dr. Kesselheim, okay? Uh, concerns have been raised that the approval of a generic alternative REMS distribution system will inevitably lead to patent infringement systems. Given the likely overlap with the branded manufacturer's original distribution system, do you anticipate this being a problem? And I have been a critic of uh, bringing, uh, wanting to so much bring the patent and copyright office into the 21st century. So, Professor Olson. Yes, Mr. Chairman, uh, I do think that uh, the way that patents are, are written, uh, the fact that they have to track the statute very closely means that it will be very easy to bring infringement suits. Even if the patent is found invalid or the suit is not successful, uh, this listing them in the orange book and the litigation can delay significantly delay generic uh, entrance. Furthermore, there's no additional incentive that is given by granting RIMS patents that is needed because there is already an incentive to create the RIMS and Itasu systems because you don't get to market your drug unless you create it. They're a tiny fraction of the cost of drug development. And so by forcing sharing uh, or at least stopping companies from uh, arguing that if, if generics don't share, they may not market the drug, we're not going to be losing anything. Uh, we're not going to lose any benefit. Professor? Uh, well, first of all, I, I disagree with Professor Olson that there isn't much difference between the statutory language and the REMS patents. Uh, the statute describes in very general terms the type of access restrictions that are permitted. And anyone who's ever worked on designing a risk management plan or negotiating a REMS with FDA can tell you that there are many ways to mitigate a risk. and. The REMS themselves are very detailed and there are a lot of decision points along the way. I think the question that matters is whether it's possible to mitigate a particular risk more than one way, and that's a clinical question and a regulatory question. It has to be answered case by case, but um, having worked on REMS issues for companies, I, my instinct is yes, there is, there's absolutely more than one way to, to design a system. Thank you. Attorney Abbott, do you care to comment? Well, it's certainly possible, uh, Mr. Chairman, as mentioned, it's possibly designing around the patent. That, that may be uh, tricky. There may, there's a, certainly a possibility of infringement lawsuits. And it could also perhaps be dealt with legislatively. I mean, if Congress wanted to, it could make it clear that, that uh, any actions taken to develop uh, uh, sort of a REM system by potential Entrant that uh, on, uh, is not going to be uh, constitute patent infringement. I'm just not saying that's a good idea or not, but there may be ways of, to have very, very narrow modifications to try and forestall the problem of opportunistic patent litigation here. You'd have to be very careful, you know, and maintain the appropriate incentives uh, to, uh, inno to innovate, but as I think as Professor Olson mentioned, it probably already are given the need to to meet FDA regulatory requirements to, to, to develop these systems. But I am not an expert in this area, but that's just my initial reaction. Doctor. 
I mean, I, I think that here we should be thinking about what's best for the patient. And to me, the, the best thing for a patient is to have a single REM system because, again, these are otherwise interchangeable drugs. It doesn't make any sense if you're a clinician or a patient to be enrolling people in different REMs for otherwise interchangeable drugs based on a manufacturer that you may not know. And so I think that ultimately we should be trying to develop a system where shared REMs are, are, are able to be done and are able to be uh, established in an efficient way. And I think that we can do that by, uh, by for example, creating royalty-free licenses for, um, for patented REMs so that uh, generic manufacturers can use them uh, or other mechanisms to try to encourage the, the development of shared REMs for, for patients' benefits. I'm going to play a little devil's advocate with myself here and like to hear what you folks have to say about it. And we'll start with you, Dr. Kesselheim. I am very familiar with, because I have a very your friend, who is now retired from in his 90s, who was a uh, uh, researcher, uh, PhD, and come working in with uh, drug companies, uh, which I won't mention. And I saw, and he's explained to me over the years, the time, the labor, the expense that goes into developing a drug. How do we, or should we even, think about that concept of, as, of uh, the profit or not meeting the profit to make sure that companies still are in the research aspect of creating life-saving drugs. Do you understand my question? Please. Sure. So, I mean, I, obviously, I think it's very important for there to be a period of time when companies can uh, make back the investment that they had in their product and make, a, and make a profit on that. But at some point, that period has to end. And currently, manufacturers, on average, get about 12 to 16 years of market exclusivity. How much longer, how much more market exclusivity is necessary? I mean, you know, manufacturers, pharmaceutical manufacturers currently make about 22% profit margins as compared to 7% profit margins for the rest of the Fortune 500. You know, uh, and, and so, I, I mean, I think that it is, it is important both for there to be a fair um, return on investment, but then at some point for that to end and for a competitive market to, to be in so that patients can get the benefit of uh, lower cost generic products. And I, I don't think what we're talking about here has any, uh, has any necessarily bearing on, on the questions of innovation. We're talking about getting timely access to generic products after an, ex an extended period of market exclusivity that already exists. Thank you. Uh, Attorney Abbott? Uh, I, I think, yes, one, one may agree or disagree about the appropriate length of, of exclusivity. But I think once the exclusivity period is over, whatever decision you make, you want to get the uh, uh, competitive products to the market as quickly as possible. I'll just note very briefly, one, it's beyond the scope of this hearing, but it's very important. One issue that American pharma firms face that's very serious is a single buyer uh, purchaser. Many foreign countries are sort of monopsony purchase, purchasers of uh, American pharmaceuticals. They say, if you want to enter our market, we, you know, we're going to dictate these price terms. So, and unfortunately, the American consumer has sort of been a loser because of that. There's been a cross subsidization. American consumers and the American uh, economy has paid more for drugs than, than foreign countries, but often that, that's a, uh, an artifact of the foreign systems, and I don't know if you can talk about international agreements or something to deal with it, but it's part of the bigger picture, again, that's beyond the scope of this hearing. Thank you. Professor Litson? Yes, thank you. This is actually an area in which I've done a, a fair amount of, of research recently. Uh, you, you're right about the cost. Uh, in addition, there is a high degree of risk. There uh, are a lot of products that, that are look, compounds that look promising at the beginning and, and fail. Uh, through the long process, so it's expensive and, and risky. And a company that does this research has to recover not only the cost of researching the drug that actually got approved, but the cost of starting to research, starting the process with the drugs that, that failed. Uh, so I, I have uh, serious concerns about the adequacy of our incentives right now, and I'm particularly concerned about the products that take a really long time. Products, for example, uh, that might uh, prevent uh, Alzheimer's, things, that, things for which we may need to do trials that exceed uh, 10 or 15 years. Um, uh, Professor Kessel, Dr. Kesselheim um, is right about the uh, average market exclusivity data, but 
I think recent economic data suggests that the break-even point for new molecular entities is somewhere in, the, in that 12 to 16-year range. And uh, innovators in other industries benefit from 17 to 20 years of patent life. And if you compare that with 12 to 14 for the drugs that we desperately need, it leaves me concerned. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Olson. Uh, I echo uh, the, the comments of Dr. Uh, Kesselheim. Uh, and just to add one thing to that, uh, Professor Leitzen's right, of course, that the risk is very high, but the profit margin overall tells you that you're getting high risk and a pretty high reward. That takes into account all the failures. Uh, the other thing I would just add is that um, uh, in, in my proud city of Boston, we have many uh, biological biotech companies. Some of them are taking 20 or 30 years to get a pathway to a drug, and yet we have this amazing ecosystem that supports that. The system uh, has worked without needing extension. When we grant extensions of exclusivity, uh, or if we can end the granting of some of these extensions of exclusivity, the drug companies will also stop focusing on trying to extend and move back to a focus on R&D, and that's where we want them to focus once their drug has been patented. Thank you. The chair now recognizes Congressman Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Professor Leitzen, um, in your written testimony, you state that requiring branded drug companies to provide drug samples to generic drug competitors is a duty to deal that will undermine innovation. How would requiring samples to off-patent drugs or drugs nearing the ending of their patent exclusivity harm innovation? Um, so I, I do believe that requiring the sale of a product ultimately requires, if it's a patented product, it requires the company to manufacture enough of the product to satisfy all of the generic applicants, all the biosimilar applicants that want it, that in, if the product is under patent, that requires the company to practice its patent for the benefit of one of its competitors. That uh, is contrary to bedrock principles of U.S. patent law right now, and in and of itself will devalue the patent, which uh, to me is concerning because Decades of research show that robust patent protection is essential for pharmaceutical innovation. All right, and um, uh, Mr. Abbott, do you agree with uh, Professor Leeson's um, character characterization that providing drug samples is a duty to deal? Do you agree with that? Um, well, Congressman, I think one has to look at this duty as a, as a general matter in non-regulated context, there isn't normally a duty to deal. Here, the problem is that in order to enter the market, you need to get hold of these samples. So yes, you are in some sense constraining a potentially intellectual property right, but it may be near the end of the patent life and it is sort of a <coughs> necessary to, to be able to enter, to enter, and if it's necessary to be able to enter, that that's you know one of the, one of the trade-offs. Uh, I think that uh, so I that would be my response. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Kesselheim, uh, as a practicing doctor, are you concerned that requiring access to branded drug samples would undermine patient safety? Uh, no, uh, I'm not. I'm, I mean, I feel like the, uh, the statute is, is well constructed to try to uh, prevent any risk of patient safety. But again, these samples are not being collected to then be uh, distributed to patients. They're being collected to be put in, uh, into laboratory and other clinical testing that is necessary to sh demonstrate to the FDA that the drug is bioequivalent and therefore the generic drug can be approved. I, I, don't, I don't really see the risk that, for example, a drug that is used in, in, uh, in elderly patients with a type of cancer called multiple myeloma but un also unfortunately has a, a birth defect risk because it's being uh, transmitted to a generic for the purpose of uh, of conducting clinical testing so that the generic can get on the market would somehow end up in the hand, hands of, of, of patients for whom it would cause a risk. I don't see that as, as a reasonable uh, uh, safety risk, and I do think that to the extent that there are um, weird ways that we could think of to, that, that might exist, the, the statute does a good job of trying to prevent that from happening by forcing the, the company to develop a plan and register that with the FDA. 
Professor Leitz, and I feel compelled to offer you the opportunity to respond. Um, yes, so these drugs are, they present very serious risks to patients, and uh, some of them are, are toxic, and many times the generic companies that request samples have no experience with drugs of this sort. Uh, some are sophisticated, but, but some do not. And uh, I think the, the concern uh, has always been that uh, if anybody in the process of conducting, especially when you get to the clinical trials, if there's any sort of lapse by anybody, the contract, the clinical research organization, not the generic company, the, the group that they contracted with to do the, the bioequivalent study, if there's any sort of lapse, the consequences can be horrific. And uh, m my own view is that the concerns that the companies have are, are valid, and I know that, that many of the companies that have been the focus of attention because they have demanded assurances about safety protocols, have in fact sold their products to generic companies that had adequate safety protocols. And to me, that is very strong evidence of good faith. Mr. Abbott, would you care to respond? Well, I, I don't know if you were asking about the questions of, of um, safety and safety. risk. I mean, I, there are Perhaps uh, Dr. Kesselheim might be best. I do know that the, there are a lot, most generic companies, they have to meet very rigorous generic companies, some of the largest uh, uh, pharmaceutical companies in the United States. They have to make, meet, in general, very rigorous safety controls. They are subject to, to potential liability of various sorts. So, uh, but perhaps Dr. Kesselheim might want to uh, have some additional comments. Uh, doctor, sure. I mean, I think I think I said what I mean. I said what, what I said before, but I think you also have to take into account the risk of not allowing this kind of normal business practice to happen, which is that um, very expensive drugs do not get uh, timely generic competition, which keeps the price high, reduces access to important drugs for uh, for patients who are, are unable to afford access. And I think you 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 also have to take into account that whole risk of not having a system in which. Um, in which businesses can, can exchange the product that they need in order to, to do the very basic FDA testing as well. Thank you, and I yield back. Chair now recognizes the ranking member, Congressman Cicilline. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'd like to begin, if I may, with you, Professor Litton. You, I wonder if you're familiar with the um, Harvard, Law, Harvard Journal on Legislation uh, written by Robin Feldman that spoke specifically about this pay for delay problem. And in her uh, writing, she gives an example of in Ray Filone's antitrust litigation. At its peak, Filone's a steroid nasal spray for allergy treatment received $1.3 billion a year in sales. Through a complicated series of citizen petitions, GlaxoSmithKline was able to stave off generic entry for 23 months. Thus, the delay achieved through citizen petitions was worth approximately $2.5 billion, assuming it maintained the peak $1.3 billion in sales per year. Um, they ended up settling that case for $185 million, so uh, even with that large settlement, uh, the delay may have been worth $2.3 billion. That's just a single example. So I just wonder how you square that with the suggestion in your testimony that uh, that this doesn't continue to be a problem and that citizen petitions aren't used by brand companies for the specific purpose of delaying entry into the market and uh, causing them to realize significant financial gains. Sure, I, I appreciate the question. I, I'm not familiar with that particular article that Professor Feldman wrote, uh, and I haven't looked at that particular example, and I don't, I don't know the date on it, if it might be prior to the change uh, in the law that Congress enacted in 2007. I think it was written last year, June No, no, the, uh, I'm sorry, the, the actual Flonase example, because I do know that FDA itself has told Congress that there have only been five generic drug approvals delayed that didn't have a public health justification since that law was enacted. So it's, it's possible, I just, I'm not familiar with that particular example, it's possible that predates the, the current situation. Uh, thank you very much. Dr. Kesselheim, am I pronouncing that correctly? 
Yes. Yes. Uh, thank you again for your testimony. I'm, I'm wondering whether you could speak a little bit about whether or not the Supreme Court's decision in FTC versus activists uh, has affected the use for pay for delay settlements. Uh, do you uh, assess that this continues to be a problem? Uh, even if it's not a lot of instances, these instances can impose significant costs on the consumer and significantly enrich uh, the brand companies. Sure. I mean, I, I do think that the FTC versus Actavis case um, has caused some shifts in, uh, you know, the FTC versus Actavis case was really about the um, FTC being able to review um, uh, pay for delay settlements that included extremely large monetary transfers like handing over of suitcases full of cash. But since then, pay for delay settlements have continued. Um, many of them also still involve monetary uh, settlements, but in, in, in many of them also now involve more complex co-marketing arrangements um, or other um, or, or other kinds of business deals, some of which may not necessarily be uh, at, at the sort of fair value that they might have otherwise been. And, and these kinds of agreements uh, persist. And I think the problem is, is that, that allowing FTC to review them is great, but it takes a really long time and a lot of resources to get through this. The Actavis case itself, which was the subject of the Supreme Court case, was started back in 2006, and we still haven't had really a full trial of it. And so uh, I do think that, that congressional action is needed um, to try to prevent um, uh, settlements that, are, that, that go beyond um, mere exchanges of, uh, of litigation costs. And, and do you think we sh ought to consider as well uh, enactment of, an, of a prohibition, uh, a statutory prohibition of pay for delay, like to completely prohibit that activity as a matter of law? Well, I mean, I do think that the, the FTC in the past has said that, the, that it would prefer a kind of a per se rule where these kinds of agreements are presumed not to be uh, legitimate unless there is a, a, a sort of compelling justification that is provided for them. And, and, you know, Other and than that, the enrichment of the brand drug company. Right, a compelling public health justification, uh, not a compelling personal or, or uh, market uh, profit justification. Um, and I do think that that might be a, a good model to, to consider. Professor Olson, would you, do you like your thoughts on that as well? Uh, yes, I, I agree. Um, uh, I, I think that um, the, uh, the, there, there is a, a case to be made for per se treatment. The Supreme Court did not uh, do that in activists, but uh, uh, I, think, I think the court eventually is getting to the right answer, but it will take many, many years. And it's hard to come up with much significant harm that would come from simply prohibiting uh, transfers of value to the generic company for basically uh, delaying. And I'm wondering whether uh, any of the members of the panel, as my last question, uh, have any suggestions of improvements that we might make to the CREATES Act or consider. I expect that, um, Professor Olson, you were um, nice enough to describe the CREATES Act as an elegant narrowly tailored fix. Nobody's ever called our legislation elegant, so we, we like that. But uh, I'm just curious to know whether or not you think there are uh, ways that we could improve the legislation that you've reviewed. Uh, yes, sir. So, um, I, I, you know, uh, I do think that it's, it's narrowly tailored, and, and I'll stick by the word elegant. Uh, I think there could be some, some leeway on the period of, you know, is it 30 days or 45 days? I wouldn't go, uh, uh, you know, is it 120 or 150 days? But I wouldn't go much farther, and, and I would point out that uh, coming up with an Atasu in the first place, uh, the, the company's only given 120 days, so I, I think the time frames you've chosen are uh, very good. Uh, and and I, I think there are other ways to address the issues you're getting at that would go beyond the CREATES Act, but for what the CREATES Act is specifically getting at, I think it does a very good job. Thank you. Doctor? Um, I guess I would just go back to my point that, you know, I, I think that it, if you want to focus on just the issues that the CREATES Act covers, which is the REMS and the, um, um, and the products, I mean, I think that you, you could add provisions that would um, again, require REMS, to, uh, REMS information to be public so there is no proprietary information about REMS so that everybody knows what's in a REMS and generic manufacturers can just can create their own REMS without having to haggle with the manufacturer for proprietary information. And I think you could include provisions to, that, not, that do not allow REMS patents to be listed with the FDA so that they don't block uh, entry of generic drugs as, as secondary patents. Great. Anyone else? I'll just briefly say, it's interesting, this our, our notion of uh, the REMS, uh, 
as sort of a regulated public utility model, and certainly possible, there are, to the extent, and again, I really don't know enough about science, but to the extent you do have one uh, sort of optimal set of safety protocols, there are some issues. I think in that situation, though, if you wanted access to this, you would not necessarily, uh, the brand name drug company, I'd say, wait a second, okay, if, can see that argument, but we shouldn't have to bear all the costs and, and the risk of developing it. There should be some some way of, of having the FDA or getting some co compensation and making sure that everyone has sort of uh, access to this uh, efficient uh, public facility. So you, you have to also take that the potential cost to the brand companies as well. I just want to echo that, and I agree. And I think that managing the REMS as, a, as you know, through the FDA instead of making it be uh, making them be managed through the companies would be helpful. And again, with the proper resources, uh, because as I said before, it, it is optimal for patients who are otherwise who don't know who their generic manufacturer is, because generic drugs are interchangeable with each other, to have to go to different. Um, REMS uh, based on whoever the generic manufacturer is is inefficient and would be frustrating for me as a clinician to try to figure out, well, who should I be calling, which registry should I be calling. It should all be centralized and the, and the best, maybe the optimal way to do that would be to have the REMS authority be within the FDA and, and the FDA to be properly resourced to run the single central REMS and then none of these issues would, be, would exist. Great. I know my time. Thank the chairman for indulging me. Uh, thank you very much. You're back. Oh, I knew that. No, I'm good. Would each of you, if you care to respond to my question, give an explanation for the general public, because we're throwing around a lot of language here in testing and retesting. What if uh, an originator of a drug has to go through to get that drug to the market, and what difference is there, if any, for the generic company to get that drug to the market. So, please. I'll start. So, uh, you know, a brand name manufacturer usually has to go through a period of preclinical testing that leads ultimately to an investigational new drug application, and then a period of clinical trials that takes on average about six to seven years, and then files a new drug application with the, uh, with the FDA uh, that then is reviewed in on average about eight months. Uh, brand name manufacturers, or that's a brand name manufacturers, or generic manufacturers have to prove that their drug is bioequivalent, um, which is to say, um, you know, based on, uh, on preclinical and very limited clinical trials show that the um, bioavailability of the drug and the blood levels of the drug um, are, are their, for their version is the same as the brand name version, which is why, of course, the samples of the brand name version are so critical. Uh, and then go through the, and, uh, a, a sort of, a, a, again, a more limited FDA review process only because there's less data that the, that the generic manufacturer is submitting to the FDA. Um, and then the uh, generic manufacturer's drug may be evaluated by the FDA as being interchangeable and be able to go on the market. Can you give an estimate of some time, because you did bring out estimate for the original company of 78 ye years of just one segment of testing. Right, I think, I think that, 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 that pre, the, the bioequivalence testing uh, can take far, far less than that. It probably takes, um, you know, in the, in the sort of months to small number of years rather than uh, on average about six to seven years. Um, and uh, the, the generic review period by the FDA, you know, as of five years ago was actually much longer than the brand name review period because of far less resources that are dedicated to the Office of Generic Drugs. That's changed in the last few years, and now the uh, generic drug review process is, is faster, although still I think average is more like 12 to 18 months rather than the, on average about eight months for brand name drugs. Any, anyone else? Um, no, I, I think actually uh, Dr. Kesselheim's description of the approval, the, the two different approval pathways is, is entirely right. The, the only thing I would add is that I believe the Federal Trade Commission uh, wrote a few years ago that the process for developing and getting a generic drug approved was three to five years. I don't know if that remains true, but that's what they said in, I think, 2009. So I just want, uh, Professor Olson. Yes, I just wanted to, I, I agree with that process. I want to add on, though, it's a little bit different for lar large molecule biologics. Uh, so for large molecule biologics, the testing for a generic 
uh, takes longer and it's much more complex because it's a more complex molecule and because the cell lines can change some over time. So it's key that these generics are provided samples not just once but several times over a period of could be a year or so. And that actually makes the, the CREATES Act or some approach like it very important because a brand name could uh, basically disrupt and ruin the testing of uh, uh, someone trying to do a biosimilar simply by not providing samples in the middle of a testing uh, procedure. Congressman, could I just make sure. one comment on that? Um, FDA has actually said that uh, a biosimilar company can use a foreign uh, sourced version of the reference product for much, probably not all, but much of that application. I just wanted to make sure you were aware of that. Okay. Uh, obviously, there's no other. Uh, it, uh, Congressman Cicilline has something. Yeah, I just, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll just ask unanimous consent to make a part of the record this uh, article, Drug Wars, A New Generation of Generic Pharmaceutical Delay by uh, Robin Feldman and Evan Frandorf as a part of the record. Without objection. Uh, this concludes today's hearing. I want to thank you very much. We could sit here for another 24 hours and I got a million questions in my head. But if, as always, if you have anything to offer us, uh, as I, uh, Mr. Cicilline, as uh, what we usually say, either one of us is, what do you think of our legislation? That's important to us. You're the experts, uh, we're the legislators, and we need your assistance as well. So again, thank each and every one of you for being here. I'm sure we'll see each other in the future at some time. So without objection, all members will have five legislative days to submit additional written questions for the witnesses or additional materials for the record. Uh, this hearing is adjourned and we're gonna go vote again shortly.